Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, uh, Southern Baptist Church, about 45 minutes from here in Lawrence. And I come out here throughout the week to preach the gospel of salvation to you, to tell you about the good news of Jesus Christ, to tell you that God saves from sin, that you can have redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God has made the way of salvation. He has made a way, and it's the way. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, He said in uh, John 14, 6, He is the way and the truth and the life. Dear friends, I'm out here to tell you about Jesus Christ and what He came to do and who He is and the office which He occupies. I'm here also to warn you about the bad news, to tell you first the bad news, to warn you about your sin, to warn you about God's judgment, but to reveal to you the way of salvation that God has prepared an ark of salvation in the sight of all people, that God has sent forth His Son to not, not to judge the world, but to save the world, to seek and to save those who were dead in their sins. And friends, that is exactly where many of you are this very evening, dead in your sins. But God, God can raise to life those who are dead in their sins. And I myself am a living example of that. For I was, I was bound in the chains of iniquity. I was held prison, held captive to the will of Satan. But God saved me from my sin. God rescued me from the shackles of iniquity. And friends, you can be free in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Friends, that text is directed to Christians, but you can be in that group be in that group of those who've been set free from the bondage to sin. And the text of Scripture I'd like to look at is in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 7, the text reads this. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. And friends, if I could give this a title, it would be Redemption Through Christ Alone. Redemption Through Christ Alone. Friends, that's what you need. That's what you need more than anything else. More than a 401k or a great retirement plan or a good job or an excellent marriage. You need redemption. That's the number one need that all people have. My friends, it is the pressing need of our day, and yet it is neglected by so many. In fact, many people treat this life as a, as a life simply that is to be spent pursuing the cares of the world. But the problem is, is it all comes to nothing. The most rich, the most powerful, the most famous in this world, they die, and everything that they, everything that they had, everything that they owned, all the power they possessed, came to nothing. Great kingdoms have arisen and dissolved. Great kings have ascended to the throne and been overthrown. My friends, the cares of this life pass away. Wealth passes away. Health passes away. Your marriage will pass away. But my friends, the one thing that will abide forever is your soul. And so that's the pressing issue. Where is your soul before God? Are you in a right standing with your Creator? Or are you in a wrong standing with your Creator? See, friends, many preachers will say, you need a relationship with God. Well, friends, the, the problem with that is you already have a relationship with God. Simply the question is, is it a good relationship or is it a bad one? Is it a relationship of enmity? Is it a relationship of hostility? Or is it a relationship of reconciliation? And my friends, that reconciliation only comes about through one way. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Away with this false notion that there are many ways to God. That, well, you know, the, the, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Muslims and Catholics, everybody can have their own way to God. Friends, Jesus Christ is the only way. He came preaching the exclusive message of salvation. And for it, He was crucified. He was so hated for what He said. In fact, uh, the greatest offense today in America is to say that there's one way to God. It's to say there's absolute truth. It's to say that you're wrong if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We live in a postmodern age. But friends, it is true. It is true that you need redemption through His blood. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been redeemed through the Lamb? Have you been redeemed by the Lamb who was slain at Calvary's cross? Have you been reconciled to God? My friends, there is no greater question that you can answer in this life. There is no greater question. This is the most pressing issue. Friends, I exhort you to deal with this today. I exhort you to cry out to God that you might be reconciled to Him. For many of you have committed sin. In fact, we all have. I myself have done. I myself have committed sin. For the law of the Lord is perfect and it shows not only God's character, but our flaws, our sin, our rebellion, our enmity and hatred for God. It shows that we ourselves are sinners. And as I said a moment ago, dead in sin. As Ephesians 2.1 reads, And so friends, there's only one way, or there's hell. There's only one way to heaven. All other roads lead to damnation. All other roads lead to the lake of fire. All other roads lead to hellfire, friends. My friends, your sins are not worth going to hell over. No sin is. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but you will reap the, you will reap the rewards of it, and the rewards are not good. You earn for yourself damnation, a place in the lake of fire when you sin against God, friends. And the only way this guilt can be removed is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And so here the Apostle Paul in verse 7 of Ephesians 1 puts that forward, that redemption is in Him. It is in Christ alone. And the context of Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul is covering the topic of soteriology. He's co covering this topic of salvation, of how someone is to be made right with their Creator. There's no greater, no more important topic than one can discuss or one can think about. Do you have a YouTube channel? Yes, yeah, I do. Oh, what mm -hmm. is it? What's it called? What's it called? Who's spreading around? Oh, thank you. Um, here, here's what I'll do. I'll give you... Um, Wait, what's this crime? This is one, my card. If you type in my name yeah. on YouTube and you type in preaching, it'll come up. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, thanks. Yeah, you guys yeah. have a good day. God bless. So here, I'll give you something. I'll give you guys something. Because you guys are so friendly. I'll give you guys uh, something that's really cool. I only give it out to certain people. Okay. Can't see it yet. Who wants a million dollars? Me, me, oh, me, 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 it is it's not real because there's no such thing as a million dollar bill. It's too much money. <laughs> yeah, and on the other side has got a gospel message. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, friends. Yeah, you can keep a few extra, but I'd like you to hand out the rest of them if you could. Or give them to your friends or, or whatever. Yeah, we, we come from the soccer place, well, the Celebration Army. Okay. All the way over there. We just came here just to like have fun for a little bit and buy the kids like some things that they want to get. And right here we just came around and we just caught you here and uh, I might spread the, well I am going to spread on social media so give it out on like on media like YouTube, social, like <laughs> my Snapchat, We're Facebook. YouTube. Thank you, thank you, yeah, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, you'll be on YouTube now. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, we're on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. How much stuff do you have? Oh, uh, I last time I checked, it wasn't too many. I, I don't really remember. Maybe thirty, maybe over we'll, thirty. We'll boost it up. We'll boost it up. Thank you. You guys have a good evening. Okay. Wow. <laughs> oh man, we're the social media generation. They're all excited. Well, I do that, and then, yeah, for the edification of, of other believers. It's very encouraging to watch other street preachers, for me at least. Well, yeah, for everybody. Let's go social media. It's precisely, precisely. I don't deal with it, but I should. I'm a little behind when it comes to technology and computer stuff. <laughs> I'm trying to shut off my camera right now. There it is. 
All right, where was I now? I, I remember. I remember uh, Ephesians one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you saying to me? Huh? Are you saying to me? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. The what? The gentle. I, that's what I never heard that. That's so cool. I use the New American Standard. Is that what that translation. Is? Mm -hmm. uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure. No, no. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank you. So that's that's like verses one through twelve, I think. But um, certainly those are those are an those are an encouragement, folks. As I was saying, the apostle Paul is is discussing salvation. It's the most important issue in your life. Where you're going to go when, you're di when you die. It's, it's the most important thing you can deal with about your life is your soul. Because it will continue on. My friends, you, you will lose things in this life and you can regain things. But once your soul is lost, it cannot be regained. The Lord Jesus Christ said that what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? My friends, what will it profit you if you live for this life and the pleasures of the flesh, but then die and go to hell, what profit is it for you? What does that profit you in the end? Nothing. My friends, live for eternity. We're on the precipice of eternity. We're about to step over the cliff. Friends, in fact, on this very day, 151,000 people will step over that cliff and they will enter into eternity. Oh, my friends, please, be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And that is found in His redemptive work at the cross. It's found in His shedding of His precious blood. And that's precisely what I want to look at here in verse 7 of Ephesians 1. That salvation, that redemption is accomplished through the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But my friends, I want to first establish why redemption must be accomplished. Why must we, we be made right with God? Why? That is the question that first must be asked. Well, friends, this may perplex you, but I first say this, that God is good and holy. That is why. God is a righteous judge, and He is absolutely perfect, righteous in all His ways. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, 107, he says, right, or excuse me, um, verse 137, He says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Friends, God is so compassionate and gracious. He is abounding in loving kindness. Yet, yet Exodus 34 reads that He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In fact, the prophets, time and time again, God raised up prophet upon prophet to preach a message of God's ensuing wrath and coming judgment. In fact, when you read through the prophets of the Old Testament, they were preaching judgment. They were preaching wrath. They were preaching hellfire preaching. It was hard preaching. It was soul convicting preaching. It was soul gripping truth, my friends. See, you have to understand and grasp the bad news before you can understand the good news. You must first see your sin before your Creator, before you can see His gracious salvation. My friends, you must come to see how filthy you are, to see how gross your iniquities are before the Lord, that you might be cleansed by the precious blood of the Lamb, that you might be washed clean, that your garments might be cleansed. Friends, God has put forth His holy law, His holy law which is resisted by the human heart. And His law, He has said many things, many things that I could talk about this evening. But I will simply say, God has said, you shall not lie. You shall not lie. How often have we done that, friends? How often have you lied in your life? You have guilt before God, friends. Or here's another one. God says you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not use God's name in an irreverent manner. But how often? How often do people take God's name? Hey, I'd love to have a discussion. I don't want you just to walk away. I'd love to discuss, it, discuss with you if you have an issue. What are you, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm preaching the gospel. Okay. 
the good news of Jesus Christ. So, what's that? Christianity. Uh -huh. The religion of the Bible. I get that a lot. I'm going to go use the rest of the world. Okay. I'm Catholic, my man. Okay, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Where are you going? Hey, when I die, I'll know where I'm going. Where are you going? You feel me? No, that's a that's a that's a horrible bet to make. I'd I'd love to discuss with you. I don't want you to walk away, sir. You need salvation in Christ. You gotta have assurance of faith, my friends. Don't, don't, don't gamble with your soul. Don't say, well, I'll find out when I die, friends. That's useless. Because I I'll tell you this much, my friends. You'll wake up in hell and you'll regret it. You'll regret it, friends. Do not do that. Do not lose your soul for your sins. Do not lose your soul for your iniquity and your pornography and your lust. Friends, God can save you from your sins. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord over all. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, He is the Lord of glory. He dwells in unapproachable light. But as I was saying, my friends, God has said in His law, you shall not bless Him. I myself did that for so long. Friends, I have this guilt before God. You have this guilt before God. Or well, here's another one. This one might convict you, my friends. God says you shall not commit adultery. And people say, well, I have never, I have never committed adultery. I've always been faithful to my spouse. They'll say, I've always been faithful even to my boyfriends or girlfriends, which I've had in the past. They'll argue that they have had fidelity. They've been faithful. But listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5. He says, in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. My friends, and then listen to what he says in the next verse, in verse 29. He says, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. Friends, God sees the mind and He sees your heart. He knows your intentions are not right, that you're evil. He sees your heart, that it is wicked. That is why Jesus said here in this chapter in Matthew 5 that God sees your lustful thoughts. He sees your selfish thoughts. God bless you, young men. Remember the Lord in your youth. Oh, they're very polite as well. Good manners, young men. Good. They said, yes, sir. We need more. We need kids to say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, like the old days. But as I was saying, friends, God sees the mind. In fact, uh, Jesus goes on in this chapter, and uh, or actually in the in the previous uh, verses, and he explains that murder, uh, that murder, you're guilty of the crime of murder if you even have hatred in your heart, if you even have anger, unjustified anger towards someone in your heart, my friends. Oh, the guilt of sinful mankind. Another one. I'll give you another command that God gave. But friends, honestly, you know in your heart of hearts you have fallen short. But much more than fallen short, you've trampled it underfoot. You've disregarded it because of your hatred of God. Friends, uh, Romans 1.30 says that sinners are haters of God. Friends, do not be deceived and think that people are indifferent toward God. That there's a neutral position. My friends, you're either a hater of God or a lover of God. You're either the friend of God or the enemy of God. You're either reconciled to God or you're at enmity with Him. Friends, there's no middle ground. Jesus said that you're either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so because of this guilt, because of the guilt which we have before God, we deserve the punishment. Friends, a murderer here in Greenville deserves the death penalty because they've broken the law. We would all agree upon that. Someone who's broken the law deserves to pay the fine, deserves to take the punishment because they've broken the law. And friends, how much more God, who is righteous and holy and pure, who is absolutely perfect, how much more will He punish the wicked? And this is something that people apparently dislike about God. And so what they do is they create a false God in their own minds who suits their own desires, who suits their own passions, who suits their own lusts, and who is no God at all. Friends, the God of Scripture is love. He is gracious. He is compassionate. But you must not forget He is holy. And He will never sacrifice His holy character on the altar of His love.
He will never sacrifice His righteousness for grace. No, my friends, and that is where the Gospel brings those two together. A synthesis of the glorious attributes of the Almighty. God's grace and righteousness meet. Love and justice kiss. My friends, that is the glory of the Gospel, which we will look at in a moment. But this is so important. You understand the holiness of God. My friends, even the most astute theological minds cannot begin to grasp the holiness of God. In fact, in, in Isaiah 6, God allows the prophet Isaiah to have a vision of God in heaven where he appears in God's throne room in glory and he beholds the, the Lord Jesus Christ seated upon his throne and he records these words in Isaiah 6. He says that there was two angels in the throne room and each had six wings, two which they would cover their eyes with, two which they would cover their feet with, and two they would fly. And this is what those angels were proclaiming in that throne room. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory, my friends. Even the angels of heaven, the holy angels, apart from sin, are standing in God's presence at this very moment and crying out one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Where is a sense of God's holiness in the land? My friends, where is a sense of the righteousness of God in this city? Where is a sense of the justice of God? People have lost the concept that God hates sin. God hates it with a vengeance. My friends, there must be payment. There must be restitution. There must be atonement. There must be justice. Think if you, if you, if you could for a moment, my friends, about a judge here in Greenville. If a judge were to let a, a convicted felon, a thief or an adult, a robber or a, a murderer off the hook for no reason, just let him off and there was no punishment. There was no judgment. There was no justice. Sir, do you have a, did you have a question? Oh, okay, I didn't. If you do, I mean, I'm more than... Okay, thank you, thank you. He was just saying he was waiting. He had the most expensive thing, but he's interested. In Isaiah 6, when you figure out if you're a hate preacher or if you're actually just reading... Well, story. here's what I have to do. No, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. Go. Okay. Go. Well, I appreciate you, like, wanting to oh, listen. You're going to scare me off, man. Just keep going. Okay, keep okay. <clears throat> So my friends, because of the holiness of God, His punishment for sin, His punishment for iniquity is what? What is it? Well, the, the Scriptures answer, in fact, we just read that text out of Matthew 5. Jesus uses the Greek word Gehenna. That is the, the place of burning fire. It's a place of torment and agony. And friends, I come out here because I love you and I care for you. And I don't want you to go to hell in your sins. I don't want you to perish. I certainly would not stand on this wall on a Friday night in July and tell you this if I did not care about you. In fact, I'd be at home doing something else. But friends, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to perish in your sins. Instead, I want you to be made right with God through Jesus Christ. And that leads me to the text that I looked at at the beginning, which is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, which the Apostle Paul says, that in Him we have redemption through His blood. My friends, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed for sinners at Calvary. See, my friends, God being rich in mercy, yet never negating His holiness, sends His Son, and His Son comes and fulfills the law, as Matthew 5.17 says. Jesus declared, I have not come to abolish the law. No, I have come to fulfill it. He came and lived a perfect life on behalf of God's people. And then He was beat and whipped and mocked. He was nailed to a cross. He was nailed to the cross of Calvary. And He was slain there as the Lamb of God. My friends, His life was poured out unto death. God slew His Son. God unleashed upon His Son the full fury of His judgment, the full fury of His wrath. This is the glory of the Gospel. Jesus takes my sin. My friends, he satisfied the wrath of God. Isaiah 53.10 says, But it pleased Yahweh to crush him, to put him to grief. 
if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring, he would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. My friends, Christ is the intercessor between God and man. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Away with the Pope, away with Mary, away with worshiping saints. Christ is the mediator. Christ is all. Christ is the sufficient Savior. My friends, you must take Christ for all that He is or you cannot have Him at all. You cannot pick parts about Jesus that you like and reject the rest. My friends, he, you must come to Him on His terms. And so He dies on the cross. He satisfies the wrath of God. And then He is raised to life on the third day. The Father raises His Son from the grave as the public declaration, as the public proclamation that Christ had paid for sin, that Christ had satisfied the wrath of God, that Christ had placated God's judgment. That there is no drop of God's judgment left for the elect. There's not a drop left, friends. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the depth and the length and the breadth and the height of God's love toward His people. My friends, that also shows us not only God's love, but His righteousness. It not only shows us the fact that God so loved the world, but it also shows us that God so hated sin. As uh, Romans 3 verse 26 says, Or excuse me, in verse 25, he says, Whom God, he's speaking of Jesus Christ, he says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. And that word propitiation, it means wrath has been absorbed. In fact, we, we, will, we use a shortened um, version of that word in modern day language. We say, He is propitious toward that other person. He forgives. And that is precisely what the cross is. Christ satisfies. He placates the wrath of God. He satisfies God's judgment. And why is that? Well, it says in verse 25, In His blood through faith, this was to demonstrate His righteousness. Friends, God is so righteous. And the cross is a declaration of that. The cross is a revealing of that. It's a revealing of, of God going to such an extreme to, to lay down the life of His Son. In fact, I love the way the hymn puts it. It says, How deep the Father's love for us. God bless you. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which marred the Chosen One bring many sons to glory. Friends, this is the Gospel message. This is what I came out here to tell you about. This is what at the, at the outset of this I began to proclaim. My friends, this is the good news. And not only that, but Christ was exalted to the right hand of majesty on high as the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Friends, but I want to explain to you something that is relevant to the passage we're looking at. Going back to Ephesians 1 verse 7, he says, In Him, now obviously, from what I've told you that so far, it's clear to all of us that salvation is in Christ alone. Salvation is in Him alone. It is exclusive. God's love, God's affection is exclusive. It is not equally set upon every person. It is not equally upon everyone. It is set on a particular people whom God has chosen to pour out mercy on. And it's all revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh friends, oh my dear friends, and I tell you that because I love you. I don't want you to die in your sins. Listen to the words of this text. Listen to the preciousness of this. So it says, in Him, what does it say? We have redemption through His blood. Now what does that mean that we have redemption through His blood? What does it mean that we are cleansed by the blood of Christ as Scripture portrays? What does that mean? Does that mean that when someone believes, they are actually washed by blood? Well, certainly not, because it's not happened to myself or anyone I've ever known. My friends, it is not a physical uh, cleansing. It's not physical blood. It's a spiritual cleansing. But what does it mean that the blood of Jesus Christ accomplishes redemption? Well, in order to understand this concept, we must venture into old times. We must take a trip back in time and walk into the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, in the Levitical law, God instituted a system of animal sacrifice. 
And it was to show the Israelites that sin had to be paid for. Justice had to be served. It showed the holiness of God. It showed the righteousness of God. It showed the justice of God. It showed the grace of God. The Levitical law of of sacrifice was put forth to show the Israelites that a coming Savior, the Lamb was coming. Because as we know from the book of Hebrews, no animal can take away your sins. No animal can take away sins, my friends. If, if there are any people who are perhaps of Jewish descendant, perhaps you're Jewish, you're of Jewish lineage, well, I just want to tell you, my friends, that Yeshua is HaMashiach. He is Messiah. He is the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. He is Yeshua bin Dawid, the son of David. And He reigns on the throne of His father David this very day, my friends. He reigns on the throne of His father David as God and King of the universe. But as I was saying, so God institutes this law. And and so in the Old Testament, God gave specific rules on how animal sacrifice was to be conducted. The priest would have to slit the throat of the animal and the blood would spill out. And the blood we know from Scripture is a symbol of the life of the animal being taken from it. It is a symbol of the life of that animal being drained out so that the life of the sinner would not have to be required of them. And this is a foreshadowing of the gospel message. Because Christ comes along and He sheds His blood at the cross. He sheds His blood for His people's sin. And it's a symbol of His life being poured out as a ransom for many. Jesus said Himself in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost, among whom I am the most wretched and vile. And my friends, you should think the same about yourself. For you are much more wicked than you can think. Your pornography and your lust, your drunkenness and your idolatry, your selfishness is much worse than you can think. Your hatred is much worse than you can possibly fathom. But the grace of God is so much greater than the greatest and most evil and most wretched and most wicked sins we can possibly commit. The grace... God bless you guys. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. And so my friends, the grace of God is revealed at the cross. We don't know yet. Any ideas? Yes. And so my friends, He poured out His life unto death. Even death on a cross. And so, my friends, in light of the cross, in light of the cross, this is the imperative. This is the command in light of the cross. Everyone must repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said in Luke 13.3, repent. Jesus said in Luke 13.5, repent. Uh, The Apostle Paul said in in, um, Acts 20, repent and believe. My friends, you must turn from your sins. You must turn from your selfishness. You must turn from your self-worship. You must turn from self-interest. You must flee your pornography. You must flee your gluttony. You must flee your selfishness, friends, and flee to the cross. Turn from your sins and live. Turn to Christ. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, turn to me and live all the ends of the earth. Look to the Son of God who was raised up. Oh, my friends, the offer is laid before you today. The offer of salvation is put forth. It's laid bare before you. In fact, listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 3, in verse uh, 13. Would you like to talk? All right. What book is Lydia in? Lydia is in Acts. Lydia, yeah. Elizabeth is also a good name. Elizabeth? Elizabeth. B-E-T. That's the... Uh, it, it's a Greek name. And so transliterated out of Greek, it's Elizabeth. B-E-T. Slightly different spelling, and that way you're not just Elizabeth like everyone else. So. <laughs> and so, friends... If you repent and you trust in Christ alone, that is, you flee self-confidence, you flee self-trust, you flee 
trusting in your religion, trusting in your prayers, trusting in a priest, trusting in a pastor, trusting in your Bible reading, and you turn to Christ and you cling to Him alone for eternal life. The Bible says your sins will be forgiven you. You'll be washed clean of your sin. You'll be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And God will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. God will count you as having lived Christ's life. That's the exchange of the gospel. That He takes my sin and I get His righteousness. He takes my filth, I get His perfect garments of righteousness. Friends, is your soul clothed in the garments of your sin or the garments of Christ's perfect righteousness? Are you wrapped in the righteousness of Christ? Is your hope in Him? Uh, uh, Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the Savior would come and His name would be Yahweh to sit canoe. That is the Lord, our righteousness. My friends, is Christ your righteousness? Is Christ your hope for heaven? Or is your hope built on something lesser? Is your hope built on your performance? My friends, flee, flee your self-confidence. He who trusts in himself will come to ruin. But he who trusts in the Lord he will have life eternal. Friends, so many people are trusting in their religion and it will never save them. It will never save them from their sins. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal... What's that? Yes, it's, it's, it's pretty slow. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Have you been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen to the words of Isaiah 26, verse 4. It says, uh, Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Oh, my friends, are you trusting in the everlasting rock? That is the Lord of hosts. What do you say? For in, in God alone, we have an everlasting rock. Is that what he said? Rock? Mm -hmm. That's so great. That's right. We stand upon the stone. We stand upon the firm foundation. Oh, praise God. There's soldiers. I see soldiers in the distance. We see relief. We see troops. The Lord has sent forth his, his holy servants. The Lord has sent forth more troops into the battlefield, my friends. The glorious... The glorious guns of the gospel will be firing off. And sinners' hearts' hearts will be pierced if the Lord wills. But my friends, if you do this, God will save you from your sins. You'll be cleansed of your iniquity. You'll be cleansed of your transgressions and your sins. And wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Please, please, inhabitants of Greenville, please. Consider the word of the Lord. These are not. This is not my speculation. This is something I've come up with. Go to the word of God and see for yourself. See the glory of Jesus Christ on every page. Oh, my friends. And then to go to the second part there of verse 7. He says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Have you been lavished with the riches of Christ's grace? Have you received grace? grace of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been reconciled to God? Even you who are religious, even you who think yourselves to be Christians, even you who think yourselves to be right with God, you may be a deacon at a church, you may be uh, involved in religious services, but friends, let me ask you even, have you trusted upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone? Has your trust been founded on the rock of salvation? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Is your hope in Him? Can you say that you worship Him and Him alone and nothing else? Are you doing? In fact, in, uh, could you say that you worship the Lord Jesus Christ just as the angels did and will be doing in Revelation, as it records in Revelation 5? In verse 12 it says, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Can you say that Jesus is the pearl of great price to you? Can you say He is your everything? That He is your all in all? That He is precious to you? Or is He some side ornament? Just to ease your conscience and make you feel like you're a Christian? Is He just some person that you walked down the aisle for some years ago at some evangelistic meeting? And now you live in total hypocrisy. Friends, you didn't have salvation. You didn't get salvation. Your faith is worthless if it is such a faith. My friends, worthwhile faith, true saving faith costs you something. For Jesus himself said in Luke 9, If any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. Forever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. My friends, you must, if you are going to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, you must deny yourself daily. You must take up your cross every day. You must let go of yourself. Self-love or self-abasement. Self-fulfillment or self-forgetting. That's the, that's the question you must answer. What are you going to do? If you love your life, you lose it. But if you abase your life, you are the one who saves it. Friends, Look to Christ. Look to Him. He is so wonderful. He is so glorious. He is so gracious. Just the older that I get and the more that I walk with the Lord and I behold the glory of Christ in Scripture, I see time and time again His saving power. And I'm sure that my sister here could testify to that. That the Lord Jesus Christ just becomes more precious to us. So friends... Flee the wrath which is to come. Flee your sins. Flee God's judgment. For hell is real. Hell's fires are hot, ready to receive the ungodly. Jesus said in, in Matthew 7, many will, many will perish. Many will, many will go to the place of destruction. Many will die in their sins and be cast into hell. Friends, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you, friends. I got it. Thank you, thank you. I don't... Soldiers down there. Oh. Sure. Did you need some, a couple of tracks? No. Friends, please do not lose your soul. My friends, God sees your internet history. What your girlfriend can't see, what your mom can't see. God sees it. When you press the delete button, God's mind, it's in God's mind. He knows it. And the only way that that sin can be forgotten is through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The conscience cleansing blood of Christ. Are you troubled of conscience, O sinner? Then come to Him and be saved. Oh, my friends. I'll end off with this because the Texan's off with it the riches of His grace. My friends, give glory to God Almighty for the riches of His grace as He has revealed them in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give God the glory, my friends. Give God glory. Honor the Lord of hosts. He is worthy of worship for He has compassionately accomplished salvation for His people, lovingly, yet, yet also being just and also being righteous. Friends, give God the glory for the great things He has done through His Son. Give God honor for what He has done in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, please be reconciled to God. God is worthy. That, that's the end of, that's the end to this whole economy of salvation is to bring God glory. For we know that God works all things to the end that He Himself might be glorified. I'll leave off with these words from the Apostle Peter. In 2 Peter 3, verse 18, the Apostle Peter says to the Christians to whom he was writing, he says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he says this, and this is again, as I said, the chief end to the economy of salvation. He says, to Him be the glory 
both now and forever. Oh, excuse me. He says, to Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Glory to God.